Welcome to the Social Mobility Talks podcast brought to you by the Social Mobility Commission. The SMC publishes research on social mobility and we use this to provide advice to the government and hold them to account on social mobility. We also work to promote social mobility ourselves by collaborating with and challenging employers, professionals, universities, schools, families and all other organisations to make sure everyone's playing their part. Today's episode is hosted by me, Resham Katecha, Deputy Chair of the Social Mobility Commission, and I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome Ed Balls to the podcast. So Ed, thank you so much. I feel like you're a man who needs no introduction, um, but I will ask you to just give us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in regional inequalities and anything you've got to say on social mobility. Sure. Well, um, I have been around uh public policy and government for a long time. I was a young journalist at the Financial Times, went into um, the Treasury with Gordon Brown in 1997, was there for um, eight years and then was a Treasury Minister. Uh, I was the Secretary of State for Children, Schools and Families. So um, it was broader than, um, than only schools and education from 2007 to 2010. I was then Shadow Chancellor and, um, and I've been out of politics since I lost my seat in 2015 doing a range of different things, partly um, t television work and uh, presenting Good Morning Britain, but also um, I sort of went back to um, doing some academic work. And um, there's two strands to that. One is um, at King's College London, teaching um, master students about the Treasury and economic policy, which um, is interesting because we've had lots of civil servants do this course as part of their job, 250 Treasury civil servants studying oh. what they can learn from history over the last nine years. Um, they, you know, I think they enjoy having a few hours away from Whitehall. But then the other thing is I've been doing a series of projects at Harvard and um, there's a sort of personal dimension to this one because when I was a young um, Kennedy Scholar graduate student at um, Harvard in 1988 to 1990, the first academic piece I ever wrote was with um, two professors, Larry Summers, who went on to be very famous, and Larry Katz, about, about regional unemployment in Britain and the North-South divide. And, um, and that was a big deal in the 1980s because of the huge rise, not just in unemployment and youth unemployment, but particularly in the, um, the northern regions of the country. And so um, what's that now? Um, pretty much um, 30... 40 years on, um, I've been back looking again at the question of why regional divides have been so persistent in the UK and what we can do about it. And I've been doing that work at Harvard and King's with um, a group of um, graduate students who are the kind of same age as I was in 1988 and looking at what's changed, but I'm afraid also what has stayed the same in terms of that sort of spatial regional place inequality, which has been such a big deal in Britain over so long. And I definitely want to come back on the differences and what's been 40 years, but I think it's helpful just to set out to the audience that your research project um, has seen three reports. So I would advise yeah. everyone to read them. There's some great executive summaries and lots of interviews, but there was one in March last year, one in October last year, uh, and your most recent one came out in February of this year. Um, That's right. So it's a brilliant three-part, and I would definitely recommend people read it. Given you've just released and published yeah. the third and final report, um, could you just pull together those three reports and tell sure. us what you think the key learnings are? What should people take away? Gosh. Well, so there is um, a website, a Harvard website, which has um, the whole body of work in one place. So it's very easy to find that and to go on and look. And we did, as you said, three papers. Um, and we did this in a sort of deliberate way. The first one says, what does the economic evidence, what does the data tell us about um, what's happened in the UK? And I mean, see, the very striking thing is not only have we had uh, inequality between regions in Britain for, you know, for, uh, for many years, for centuries, unusually in the last 30, 40 years, they've widened in the UK, when in other European countries, they were narrowing. So the gap between London and the southeast and the rest of the UK now is wider than between North and South Italy or between East and West Germany. And those wow. are places which I think 30 years ago we thought were, you know, uh, exemplars of inequality. We're, we are as wide or wider now. So that inequality has continued to grow. The big change which has happened is that it shifted from being about unemployment and jobs 
into really about incomes and productivity. When I did that work in the 1980s, we looked at why was unemployment so high in um, the North or Yorkshire or Manchester compared to London in the Southeast. Whereas these days, the differences in unemployment and employment are small. The big difference is in wages, incomes and productivity. And so why has that uh, happened? And we should come back to it, but we look in kind of detail. What does the evidence tell us about what has really driven the British story, looking at it as an economist would from the data. And the second thing we do in the second paper is we went back and um, talked to people about the thing which economics can't really kind of get its head around, which is like institutions and people and relationships. And so we did, um, we talked to to 95, I think, I think it's actually slightly more than that, policymakers who were involved in making um, regional spatial um, city policy in Britain since 1979. So we spoke to three prime ministers, Tony Blair, John Major, Gordon Brown, six chancellors, lots of secretaries of state for trade and industry, employment, DWP, but also we spoke to mayors, we spoke to council leaders, we spoke to um, people who'd been involved in different levels of government outside of London, the South East, lots of civil servants, some academics as well, to ask them, what did they think they were trying to achieve why they think it hasn't worked and what lessons they draw from that. And so, and then the third paper, we say, well, given we've got this economic data, which tells us stuff, and given we've got this, um, this, this, this contemporary history, and you can go onto our website and read um, every interview in full on the record, John Major talking about what he got wrong and why, or Tony Blair, all these guys, John Major says, you know, um, we thought trickle down would work. We thought if some places did well, then the benefits would spread to other places. And he says, and I look back and I now know that trickle down failed. And that was our, our failure. And what conclusion should I draw from that? So that's the kind of reflection you get in the interviews. And then the third paper says, well, okay, given all of that stuff about the past, if you're gonna do it better in future, what we should we do now? So our latest paper, which has just come out a few weeks ago, says whoever is the next government, if you're going to do this better than the last 40 years and you're going to learn the lessons from the data, but also from the practitioners, here's what you should do differently. And so in that sense, it's a sort of you know, the papers logically follow on. You couldn't write the third one until you've done the first and the, the second, you know, and then the question always then is, is anybody going to listen? And that's what we'll find out now. Well, I hope they do, because I thought the, the reports were fascinating individually and together. Um, did you find a difference in the way people, uh, you know, the, the politicians from those regions that are doing less well or, you know, have, in a sense, been left behind um, compared to the people from London and the South East or on reflection, are people mostly in agreement about the challenges and the solutions? So I think um, the thing which is very striking to us is how much um, commonality is, there is, how much agreement there is. And that is, um, and the frustration is, um, well, if people are agreeing, then why can't we come together and agree to do things in a more collective way for the future? So, um, the, the, but there are some differences and some arguments, and we can, maybe should come back to that. Um, in the first paper, first of all, I mean, look, I think it's really important to put this one caveat down that we're, we're looking at kind of big areas, uh, London, the South East, Manchester, Yorkshire, but within every one of those areas, you have big divides. And so, you know, the challenge of social mobility is really important in Kensington and Chelsea and in the East End of London and London as a whole and London, the South East, as well as the UK. So it would be a big mistake to see this as being, you know, only a challenge for um, um, for you know, some parts of the country. Having said that, what we know is that there's strong correlation between how well places do and what that means for levels of education or going to university or life expectancy. So if you can turn around the underperformance of some big places, that um, helps provide both the resources and the impetus to improve life chances. It doesn't mean, you know, it's still quite possible as a society not to use the benefits to actually improve everybody's life chances. And which is why it's sort of challenging to have you know, our richest city with a lot of inequality in it. But that in a sense, that's a separate 
challenge than what we are um, yep. looking at. But it's kind of just an important caveat to, to kind of put down because I wouldn't want people to think that I was saying the challenge of social mobility is only about regional underperformers, but it's definitely an important aspect of it. Oh, oh, I was just going to say, I'm so glad you raised that point because actually our State of the Nation report that we produced at the end of last year shows that, for example, London has some of the highest and exactly. lowest rates of social mobility. So when people think about this as only a battle between, for example, the South East and everywhere else, we have huge challenges to tackle within these cities as well. Definitely. And, and child poverty is disproportionately high in London given levels of income. So there is a bigger child poverty problem in London. And so, you know, it's, it's not like it's, it's, it's better, it's worse. Um, and so, so, so um, I think that caveat is really kind of important. Having said that, I think once you start to look at things in terms of, um, you know, the, you know, with a particular spatial frame, that gives you some lessons which you can then apply more locally. I'll come back to that. So, um, you know, what drove this big inequality, aside from like hundreds of years of history, um, you have, first of all, um, you have a, a huge um, shake out of manufacturing in the 1980s, which is disproportionately big in the UK compared to other countries and disproportionately big in the non-London, the southeast parts of the country. Um, big falls in manufacturing employment, which have long lasting effects. And alongside that, you have this takeoff in business and financial services, which disproportionately benefit London and the Southeast. So that both of those effects pull things apart. Um, and so you can explain that and th that makes sense. But what that doesn't do is explain why the divides have persisted and grown. And um, when you look at this in a more granulated way, what you find is that the thing which is distinctive about the UK is not that we have a big, strong capital city. We do, it's unusual, but, but it's not the thing. Um, it's not that we have lots and lots of disadvantage in towns across uh, the UK, we do, but that's not so different from other places. The thing which is very striking is that our cities perform poorly outside London, the Southeast. So Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, the big conglomerations do less well compared to comparable cities in America or in continental Europe. But, and that could be because they are squeezed out by London, but it's not obvious that economically they should be. And then when you look into that, what you find is that, um, that we've done poorly on transport connectivity um, within our regions. So the, the, the fact is that, um, that, that, it, that, that as an economic area, Manchester is smaller than it should be, Leeds is smaller than it should be compared to comparable cities in Europe, because transport and housing means the area where people can sensibly travel into work are much smaller. And what we haven't done is invested enough in local transport. And where we have, it's been disproportionately in London and the Southeast rather than other places. The reason I said the thing there's a read across is because if you think that connectivity and the, the effective size of place is really important, that also challenges you to ask the question in London, the Southeast, is part of the reason some areas do less well, that they are less connected to the sort of the vibrancy of the of the um, uh, the agglomeration. And I think there is some, some truth in that. And that's why there's been kind of work done to connect um, communities to the east more effectively in the last 20 years than in the previous 20 years. So there's something about the effective size of cities. If you look, um, if you look at American cities, people can drive by car yes. to work easily over a much bigger area than in the UK, we show in our paper. And if you are in continental Europe, you can travel by public transport more easily over a wider area. And we are unusual in the UK because whether you go by car or by public transport, it's harder. And so there is a big local transport. Now, this is my personal view, is why I would not have been spending money on connecting people to London with HS2. I would have been focusing on how you really make the the northern and you know the non-London and southeast cities bigger and more connected between them, which I think was where we've ended up. We then look at um, uh, innovation. Um, we know that universities and innovation spend are such a big driver of growth. Um, we disproportionately as a country, one spend less than other countries. To the extent we spend money, 
we spend it in a more biased way to London and the southeast than we do to the rest of the country. And in fact, if you look at the map of private sector innovation spending in the UK, the public sector is more biased to London and the southeast than the private sector. So there's something about the, the, the government's been doing the wrong thing. If you look at that at education, um, people often think, well, you know, is there a problem? Are there not enough graduates? And what we show in the paper is that 30 years ago, um, I think there was a shortage of graduates outside London, the southeast. But over those these 30 years, there's been a big increase in university education. Um, and the, the extra wages you earn if you are a graduate are less than they used to be. That tells you that there's more of them. Um, but we still know that graduates in outside London, the southeast are disproportionately likely to leave their region. So I think that what that tells you is that it's not there aren't graduates. The graduates are there, but they have to leave because there aren't enough of the good jobs to keep them there. So that tells you that simply having more graduates doesn't solve the problem. What you've really got to look at is transport, innovation, the other drivers of growth. Although we do find that for science, uh, for, for, for STEM subjects and technology, engineering, there are shortages that they're across the country, but in particular in the London, non London Southeast. Then we also find that the way housing, um, you know, the shortage of housing has made things worse. That's a whole bunch of stuff. I would say that most people in policy would kind of agree with this, but there'd be some people who would say it's not about innovation. It's just about cutting taxes or reducing the size of the state. But in general, most sensible people don't say that. And um, so I would say that was quite consensual. Then when we then went on and looked to talk to all the policymakers, they all say we didn't do enough. We didn't focus early enough. We didn't spend enough money or target our resources. We were too quick to rip up the previous policy regime and start again. Everybody kind of hugely regrets the churn and instability. You know, we had regional development agencies or before the enterprise zones, and then we had local economic partnerships, and now we have mayors and all of this sort of churn and change, very, very um, kind of destabilizing. It makes it much harder to plan for the future. So there's like this big, and also I would say generally people say, we weren't willing to let go and trust enough. I want to put you on the spot on that a bit because um, I, I, it's not that I disagreed. I thought there were loads of really valuable points about consensus and working cross party and thinking of a long term plan, maybe a commission. Um, but the, the challenge I find when thinking about politicians actually taking that advice um, is our electoral system, in my opinion, doesn't reward cross party working in the way that you would need it to in order for this long term planning to take place. Um, and it's very challenging for parties if they start agreeing with each other, the immediate attack line comes back, well, you know, you may as well vote for us or they don't have any ideas of their own. So um, you were hugely influential in the 2000s. Um, if you could go back then uh, and, you know, you had the ability to say, we're going to do these three things um, and put that into place what would 2000 Z falls do um, to, sure. to tackle these issues? So I think, um, I mean, of course, politics is always contested. There's always an argument. And it's a good thing there's an argument and, and people are sort of trying to work out what the right thing to do is. Um, and sometimes it does feel as though that is more, um, that things are more con contested and divisive now than at any time. But, if you actually think, you know, what are the things which last? The things which last are the things which become consensual, the things which become agreed upon, even if they were contested at the start. So, so we made the Bank of England independent in 1997, and we established a national minimum wage. Um, we also put more money into the health service and said the national health service is our long-term future. You could go on with that list. All those things were contested at the time. But now central bank independence is, is cross party. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. agrees. We had a short period where Liz Truss looked like she wasn't going to agree and that all ended up as a bit of a catastrophe and everybody agrees again. The national minimum wage, by the time he became the chancellor, George Osborne was boasting about raising it. David Cameron said in 2010, I'll cut the deficit, not the national health service. And so it is true that things can become consensual, but, but, but sometimes, you know, in, 
the welfare state in something like i don't know auto enrollment and um, kind of spreading pensions to working people massive change cross party um so the question is what is it which um which um allows that consensus to be built i think it's probably um you know a track record of success which people then say you know that's really good and we want to keep it at any time you either don't have a track record of success because it's not succeeded or there wasn't time or people don't care in the end it's sort of um, easy to rip up so if you take um i would say the the combined authority elected mayors the mayor of greater manchester birmingham yorkshire they were quite contested when they began but actually i think most people I think most people actually in those in those um, areas, I, I think probably if you had a referendum in Manchester, should we keep the mayor? Most people would say yes. There wouldn't be that many don't knows. And what came out of our interviews is a view which is this, this potentially really works and we should stick with it. That's happened because of the track record of success and public support for it. Um, if you take something like police and crime commissioners, we have police and crime commissioners which get elected. I mean, I would think that most people in Greater Manchester don't know what one is, and they probably would not be that bothered about voting in a referendum. I'm not saying they should be got rid of, but they've not been entrenched in the no. same way. When we had a children's department, 2007, 2010, we didn't have time. There was We couldn't point to a track record. It was easy to rip it up. So I think um, the answer to your question is that, I mean, if, you, if you've got the wrong model, you have to start again. And it might be that when we went for regional development agencies, these big, huge, wide region um, kind of public bodies without any sort of underpinning in in a local democratic mandate, maybe that was a mistake. So I think probably in retrospect, I wouldn't do that again. Not not quite the way we did it. Um, but if I was wanting to win the argument, I'd want to start from the beginning and do things in a big way. You know, let's go for it and spend the money on transport and innovation and the things which will make the difference because then I'm going to make it harder for my opponents to rip it up. So in our paper, we say that there is the potential for there to be in, in the manifestos this year, some broad agreement about what needs to be done. But I think actually you are right that people simply sort of agreeing is not the thing which establishes a consensus. There are things you can do to try and deepen it as a sort of a political task. And we're sort of calling for that. But I think actually the thing which makes the difference is having a plan, sticking to it, it working, and people saying, don't rip that up. And we are closer to having that now than we've been for a while. And so I think the, the one thing I really don't want people to do is rip it up. What I'd quite like them to do is throw weight behind it to make it work better, which is what our paper's about, um, and to give it time. You know, the truth is, if you've had regional inequality for hundreds of years and it's got worse in the last 30 years, you're not going to sort it out in three. No. You might not. in 20, or you might make a real start in 20. But if you, um, if after three years you said that's not working, let's rip it up and start again, the one thing you can conclude is you're going to fail. Of course, you're just three years behind where you were when you started. Exactly. And I think that actually that's a really valuable lesson for people uh, interested in kind of politics and budding politicians thinking about how to make change. Because, um, you know, I, I I learned about 97 as an economic student. Obviously, I wasn't old enough to remember the, uh, the challenges that you faced in terms of making the Bank of England independent or the minimum wage. And obviously now... Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone that disagreed with the minimum wage. So that's really valuable. But going back to 97, um, your March paper from last year states that in most UK regions in 97, the university wage premium was higher in regions than it was in London. And by yeah. 2019, that university wage premium is now higher in London yeah. at about 40% compared to 30% in the regions, despite the fact there's a huge supply of graduates in London. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the brain drain and the lack of demand for highly skilled labour? And, and the reason I'm particularly concerned about this is 
we see, you know, this huge development of AI changing the workforce, and those jobs are likely to be very well paid and focused in London and the Southeast. So the structural issues you referenced in the 80s around manufacturing changing the economy, I think we're going to see turbocharged in the next five to 10 years. So how can we tackle that? I think that's right. So in, in um, on this kind of university point, this is one area where we say, actually government policy worked. Government policy worked because by expanding university education, um, we supplied the graduates areas needed. Um, and the reason why that wage premium falls, you know, if something is in short supply, you have to pay more, more for it. And then as there are more supply, there's more kind of people around, um, you can um, get them, you know, get them to work for you or buy your goods for a lower price. There is still a graduate wage premium. So if you're in Manchester or Leeds, you still get paid more if you're a graduate than as a non-graduate. But that premium, that gap between the average wage and the graduate wage has narrowed because there's more graduates. So that, that's a good thing. It says that we've met the demand for graduates. Um, but it's still the case that lots of graduates leave those places. So what's going on? And it's that there is another reason why there aren't um, enough jobs for them than there just not be enough of them. You know, isn't the I think lots of economists wanted to say the, the, the lack of graduates who are living in the non London, the southeast parts of the UK is a constraint. And we say, actually, it was a constraint 30 years ago. That constraint is substantially eased. Um, so it must be something else going on. However, when you a bit more granular and you say, as I said earlier, well, let's look at science graduates. Um, there's a shortage of science graduates everywhere in the UK, including London, the southeast. But that um, that shortage is is acute everywhere, including all the non-London regions. And there you've not seen a fall in that graduate wage premium. So that probably tells us that we needed to have done more to get people doing science engineering uh, degrees in the last 30 years. We should do more about that now. And then when you look at the um, kind of people getting qualifications, so um, at level three, so people are getting to A levels or their equivalent um, in vocational qualifications, you see the same pattern, which is that um, where there's a shortage, where there's a premium in their wages, is in particular in those those science technical skills. So um, part of the story is trying to make sure we train people better in universities or colleges to meet, as you said, what employers want. And what employers are wanting increasingly is those STEM technical skills. So we need to do better at that. But I think our paper also says that simply training graduates isn't enough unless you tackle those other things which seem to be holding back productive businesses growing and expanding outside London and the Southeast, which is more about transport, universities, innovation, housing, um, maybe supply of finance for kind of venture capital growing firms as well. And if you don't do um, the, the, the analysis we do in the first paper says, what do we think are the things which which bite, which which make the difference, which hold places back? And I think probably simply having more graduates is not going to solve the problem, but having more of the right kind of graduates is part of the solution. That's really helpful on universities. And I want to talk for a second about the roughly 50% of young people that don't go to university. Um, at the Social Mobility Commission, our State of the Nation report at the end of last year found that people whose parents have a university degree are more likely to have a degree themselves, so about 64% than people whose parents had no qualifications. Only about 18% of them go to university. Um, and we we are very concerned about the 21% of needs from um, and least privileged backgrounds. And they're a key group we're concerned about. So what are the proposed routes based on your research, but also your extensive political experience for roughly that 50%? So when, when um, I was doing the children's schools and families job, of course, that was a big focus for us because um, it's very easy to, to have an education department which talks about what's happening to um, the the average progress of the average child. Um, to say more of our kids are going to university um, 
a rising proportion of our young people are getting five GCSEs with English and maths. But if what you care about is um, uh, is is opportunity and fairness, then it's not some children you care about, it's every child and every young person. And therefore it's the young people who aren't uh, getting those opportunities that you are more focused and worried about. And as you say, when that correlates with um, where you live or the occupation of your parents or something else, a special educational need or um, a disability, I think what that, to me, that says, um, these are people for whom you have to kind of work extra hard. Uh, there are barriers, but you can overcome those barriers. But have you got a plan? Have you got a strategy? And a children's department cares about every young person and doesn't really only want to think about the um, the averages. Um, I don't think that this is particularly a spatial challenge, because as this is absolutely an area where you know you can you you, you can talk about um, the the productivity and average wages and kind of shortage of graduates across the UK and say there was something distinctive about uh, Manchester and the Northwest or Leeds compared to London, the Southeast. Once you start talking about um, um, young people facing disadvantage, finding it hard to get to university or get onto the job ladder, I think probably uh, there is less of a spatial dimension. There is less clear that that is, I mean, there would be parts of Manchester where that was a big problem and parts of Leeds and parts of London and parts of um, Norwich and Southampton. And so I think that, that, that there, um, you, need, you, need, you need to think about it differently. And I suppose um, one of the things we say in the paper is that sometimes we talk um, as if you have to choose between whether you lead from Whitehall or whether you, um, whether you devolve. And the reality is that that's a false choice because there are some aspects of this where it absolutely makes sense to um, to, to hand over power and decision-making to mayors and combined authorities. But there's other places where that will only work if, if you really give it a priority in terms of where your resources go, but also um, how you think about qualifications and interventions. And those are things where you need a, a Whitehall Secretary of State lead. And I don't think um, that, that we can sort this out unless it's kind of driven from the centre, um, as well as being... So uh, it's a good thing to have a mayor saying, give me more flexibility to tackle um, low rates of staying on in a part of our region. That's a good thing to do. But if you're going to really tackle this, it's also going to be something which we're saying is a national priority we drive from the centre. And so given your experience of driving from the centre as a former education secretary, in your experience, you know, I fully understand the point about every child, but what in your experience are the policy leaders that government has or that that secretary of state has to advance social mobility? What worked or didn't work when you were in government to go after the hardest to reach? And is there any advice you'd have for the next government on what they could and should be doing to tackle social mobility for the least advantaged children? I'm not kind of totally um, uh, kind of up to date with everything the government is doing to today um, or, or what the opposition is saying. Um, but I can tell you what I think. Um, I think that that uh, that children growing up in poor households where um, it's hard for them to eat properly will learn less. And that therefore the drive to tackle kind of poverty and disadvantage is just like a central part of, of this. The second thing is that um, uh, the, while it's the job of parents to make sure their kids are ready to learn, great schools know that's also a part of what they do. And, you know, I think one of the huge frustrations I had when I was um, actually came out of doing the Secretary of State job is things like breakfast clubs. Breakfast clubs can be really helpful for parents who are trying to work, balance work and family life. Um, and that's a good thing. It's kind of like a, about an ex extended version of childcare. But I would say pretty much every good head teacher I ever spoke to 
um, would say that there are a proportion of kids in our school where we pay for them to be in the breakfast club, nothing to do with work-life balance and their parents. It's if we can get them in, calm them down and get them something to eat in the first hour, their chances of learning during the day are much higher. And, and I think that is part of the school's responsibility to get their kids ready to learn. And that's what great head teachers do. Um, aspiration uh, is about um, both about trying to engage parents in backing their kids to learn, but also using the curriculum to um, inspire young people to, to learn and see what they have in themselves. And I was so frustrated by the, um, the narrowing of the curriculum with the English Baccalaureate in 2010. The number of times I would go to a, a, a really good performing uh, comprehensive school in challenging circumstances where the head would take you, take you to a dance lesson or a lesson in uh, sport and say, this is the class which will get up our um, GCSE maths results. Because what we do is we take young people's commitment to learn and do something they enjoy and are good at and help them to see that those techniques are also the techniques which will help them to get on in the subjects they find harder. And great schools use aspiration and young people's what's, what, what is engaging and interesting and what will engage parents and then translate that back into the core curriculum. So if you narrow the core curriculum and you say, actually history in modern languages is fine, but these other subjects, you know, they're not so important. You, you make it much harder to, to inspire and challenge. And then the third thing um, for my time back then was um, that so often um, a what looks like a aspirational or behavioural problem turns out to have been an, un, an unidentified learning difficulty. And that the number of head teachers I spoke to would say, if only we could know with 11 and 12 year olds when they arrive in the school, what's really going on, would have the chance to do something about that. And many of the things which which feel like they are challenging behaviour, a manifestation of, of, of a cover up for, for, for a deeper challenge. And we don't do enough um, early identification and early identif and, and, and then early intervention on learning difficulty. So one of the things which I championed was um, training dyslexia teachers. We trained thousands of just specialist uh, dyslexia teachers, not to teach kids with dyslexia, but to help other teachers in their schools and in their family of schools to spot problems early and then trigger an intervention. Because so often a young person not doing well or looking like they're not caring or not being aspirational or not getting on or behaving badly, it, it's a cover for for an unidentified learning difficulty. And that sort of one one individual child focus on identifying the barriers to learning and progress early. But you have to care about every child to do that. Of course. And, and actually, I want to pick up on that because you've been very open about saying that learning to speak publicly advanced your career. Um, and I think the points you were making about children's confidence or unidentified challenges are so important because we, we kind of expect all children to be able to communicate. And if you're unable to or scared to or don't have the skills to be able to talk in class you're you naturally fall behind so um if you're That's happy right. there, i'd love to hear a bit about how that impacted you in your career um and your support for public speaking in schools for children who might benefit from that so i th so i think i think i think the, i'll come to you in a second i think the, this communication thing is such a big deal um and and so often behavior which is challenging masks a, a struggle with communication or learning. When I became Secretary of State, I spoke to the um, head of the Head Teachers Association, which is called ASCL, School and College Leaders. And I said, I'd, I'd, I just want to go for a day, this is my first month, to um, a, a school which is off the beaten track, kind of not in the headlines, challenging, but doing well which with good leadership, not be announced, no media. I'm not going to ever just so I can spend the whole day there and the head teacher can point out to me stuff which is a um, challenge for them and in my first hour the, that she started with um, young people who arrive at 11 with um, 
unidentified problems with communication and learning. And if you, if you look at the correlation between young people who get into trouble with offending when they're 14 and 15, and what turn out to be major communication challenges about how they, they are able to, to speak or be articulate or to, to learn, I mean, it's so high. And um, so, if, so I think if you want to make a difference, I mean, you have to tackle the big socioeconomic challenges around poverty and housing and those kind of things, but you also have to think, um, what is the barrier for this child and what can we do? And primary schools have to gear up to be ready to help secondary schools focus on those things, which probably become more acute as the learning goes on. And um, anyway, I don't think my story is kind of hugely helpful in this because I didn't find out that I had a stammer until I was in the cabinet. So it was a bit late. You know, I was in my <laughs> early 40s and I think um, and I had um, very good therapy and it really made a difference. Um, but one of the things I, um, I do quite a lot of work with children who stammer and their parents. And the, the truth is that um, on the, you know, on the one hand, huge numbers of people with um, what I have, which is an interiorized stammer, where you don't overtly stammer, you just block in certain situations. They're just, they're just brilliant at covering it up. They don't tell their workmates. They often don't even tell their partner. It's just something which is concealed, but people just then tailor their behavior to avoid being in situations where they have to say their name or do a public speaking event, all those kind of things. And if you can, um, but if you can identify young people who stammer, where you know, lots of children stammer when they're very young and th then it stops. Um, but children who are still stammering into their teens will probably have a stammer all of their life in some sense. Often it's genetic, um, tends to be more boys and girls, but not, 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 um, I mean, disproportionately, but not universally. But if you can, um, identify that with 11 and 12 year old, 13 year old and start them on the right track, then, you know, I mean, so I, I would say to people, it'd be much better for me if it had been 12 rather than 42. Um, and then the other thing, I do a lot of work with the Michael Palin Centre for Stammering Children in London. I've done a number of their courses where I've turned up to talk to um, uh, people, me and Colin Firth, the actor, because of course he was in the kid's speech, um, the film about the King George who had the stammer. And what they do in the Michael Palin Centre is they have a two week course for the children, the 12, 13, 14, 15, and a two week course for the mums and dads. Oh, wow. And what the parents have to do is go through the first week essentially working out that quite a lot of what they've been doing for the past 12 years was was unhelpful you know loads and loads of dads saying to their kids come on get your words out That's what are you right. doing and actually for the for them for them to realize that um it's part of who they are um but it can be better but it won't get better if you make them feel tense and on the defensive and like it's their fault and so, you know, I spent a lot of my time talking to emotional mums and dads, realizing halfway through the course that they need to do things differently in future. But that is, um, it, it goes back to the, 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 the broader point about social mobility. Um, it's sometimes just about the, the core reality, but it's also about whether schools and parents know how to identify challenges and then support young people to to um to kind of to, you know to do better for themselves and um the, 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 with stammering it's a small example of a kind of a broader point that um there's so much you can do if you identify it earlier um, I'd love to talk about um, kind of some of the more contemporary policy ideas, um, not from a party political point of view, but just we have seen proposals that, you know, feel a bit marmite. Some people are very pro them, some people are very anti them. So Labour's proposed policy for private schools uh, and the 20% VAT. Um, do you have views on the policy and how that will support social mobility and or regional inequality? And similar question on the proposal for potentially incorporating free school meals for all primary school children. Well, I was a massive champion of free school meals and um, think that the the educational benefits were were there and clear. And, um, and interestingly, when I was Secretary of State and was, was travelling around schools, 
head teachers would generally take you to um, see the science class, a dance or sport class about aspiration, to meet the school council, and then to show you the school lunch because they knew what a big deal it was. And um, uh, and the evidence which we collected in the series of pilots was was clear, but it's really expensive. And it's at a time when there are lots of pressures, you know, I'm not going to criticise any politician who says uh, 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 that we can't do it, because I think um, uh, it's one thing to say it's a waste of money, we shouldn't do it. I was really upset when people said that about breakfast clubs, some kind of middle class perk, it so missed the point of what was going on. But I think with free school meals in primary schools, you know, nobody says it's a waste of money or very few people do but there is a resource constraint and can you afford it and is that your priority compared to there's so many other things but you know i'd love it if we if we could and then so the once you say there's things we want to do but we've been through a tough time fiscally and the national debt is high and lots of debt interest payments and you know budgets are squeezed but i think if then if you are a government um, or potential government you start thinking well you know is the money which we can find and the institute for fiscal studies says you know that at the moment if you charge vat on uh, private school fees it would raise gross 1.7 billion and then if you then say well there'd be some people who'd leave private schools and go to state schools you're still going to get about a net 1.3 billion a year and i suppose if you're the secretary of state for education you think um, i could do quite a lot with 1.3 billion a year now the government i was part of didn't do that but um if you are uh, if you are a government which is looking to raise revenue to do good things, you always have to ask the question: Is what we will do going to you know to raise the revenue? Will that do harm? The IFS says um, net big revenue raiser. So I guess you can see why they want to do it. I can see that, um, and so. I, with my day job hat on, I work in the data space. I'm also the SMC lead on uh, data and evaluation. So it made me really happy that you referenced data so much in the reports. Um, and we often say uh, at the ABI, what gets measured gets done. So across these uh, three research papers that you've done, did you find that there are meaningful data gaps or differentials in the way we um, kind of qualify or define uh, statistics that mean we're missing the full picture or that government or local government doesn't quite have the information it needs to be able to be more effective and more impactful? I think that, well, I mean, the answer is always, that's just sort of the nature of, um, of um, like, you'd always want more data and to be able to use it well. And what our, our first paper is um, very um, data intensive and we, we use some conventional data sources that so we use a lot of labor force survey data on um, wages by university over time but then on the stuff we on transport we went and found there's lots of tom tom data around you know where they measure people's journey times and we found a way to look at that internationally and what you're always trying to do i think with um good research uh, is uh, it rather take one data set and say let us find out everything this data set will tell us to answer this question and feel that satisfying. I would always rather say, let's get 10 different sources of data which come from 10 different directions and try and be rigorous with each one. And then say, when you look across the piece, does it add up to a, a picture? And I think when you look at what we've done around three or four different ways of looking at the education question or innovation or transport or, um, a kind of finance for, for for business that's what we've done so it's very data intensive but it's not sort of uh, sometimes in economic research the statistical method seems to become more important than the quality of the data or the question you're asking and we don't do that that's not our philosophy but then the second thing we did in the second paper which is a very non-data thing um, because there's lots of things data is not going to measure and um so i think contemporary history and qualitative research if you do it well can also be really interesting and it sort of shows up you know, there were four big questions which come, which we answer in our third paper, which is um, which is how far should you go on devolution, um, with with what levers, um, how much should central government drive the devolution as opposed to 
leaving it to localities to um, uh, decide? Um, and how comprehensive does it need to be? And then how far should you look at sort of tax and fiscal devolution as part of it? Those were all things which emerged as the contested issues in our contemporary history interviews. There isn't really any data which gives you that, but it does tell you where I think the policy challenge is. And then I think in the third paper, one of the things we say is you have to, unless the prime minister and the chancellor really think it's important, unless you make it at the center of your economic strategy, it won't, um, it won't really drive things. You know, when we were in government 20 years ago, um, the assault on child poverty, half in child poverty in 10 years was part of the budget. Because if it's part of the budget, if it's part of the central economic um, and social justice strategy of your government, you've got a chance of making a difference. So we want this issue around kind of growth and um, spatial inequality to be at the centre of the budget process, driven by the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. And if you're going to do that, what then is your um, your way to really drive that? And I think there's two things you can do. Internally, you could have a delivery process with data where you're continually saying to departments, you promised this, you promised that, why isn't this working, why isn't that working? That's what the delivery unit used to do. But then the Office of Budget Responsibility, which at the moment looks at growth, it looks at migration, it looks at the public finances. But I don't think at the moment they have a remit to look at the spatial distribution of growth. So I would quite like the OBR to be, as part of their budget reporting cycle, to be looking at this and saying, what's happening, what's working, is it getting better or worse? So I actually, I very much think that data is part of the, and improving the data and, but also the independent accountability, uh, the, the, the independent use of that data to drive accountability is very much part of what we need to do. And on building consensus, because we've talked a lot about political consensus, but there's obviously public opinion. Um, and inevitably there is some opportunity for us if you want to spend on inclusive sure. things local transport links in Manchester, there's less money to spend elsewhere. Um, how would you convince people in areas such as the Southeast, I know that's a, a big region, but where they might feel like, well, why are we spending money elsewhere when that means less for us? How do you, how do you get the public on side that actually that type of redistribution and investment elsewhere is in their interest? Look, it's all, I mean, there's no doubt there's been a disproportionate favoring of London and the Southeast in transport and innovation spend. Um, but that kind of redistribution is harder when you are um, reducing spending overall um, and easier when you're talking about who gets what of the increase. And the reality is that um, we've, I think, in, under invested in public infrastructure and public transport. Um, and so, maybe the focus should be less on who loses and more on where can we get the biggest gains. And I think the biggest gains now for that kind of innovation will happen in, you know, where the biggest productivity gaps are. And those are the city regions outside of London, the Southeast. Well, I'm glad that we're ending on a positive note. Good. It was such a fascinating session. If you Good. could give your three point kind of summary of the key recommendations for all the aspiring uh, future politicians and next government, what would those be? I would say um, that that you have to um, match a central focus on driving growth and productivity and incomes across the whole of the UK with a willingness to um, to, to devolve the means and resources and give financial flexibility to um, areas to then deliver. Um, secondly, that we have with combined authorities and elected mayors, a real opportunity, but it can't just be for some parts of the country. It's gotta be everywhere. You can't say to um, Burnley or to um, Hull um, or Blackpool, sorry, um, you on the outside, I think it needs to be inclusive. So I want to have a comprehensive approach to devolution um, across the whole of the, the UK. And the third thing I think is every time we say the last lot didn't do it properly, we're going to rip it up and start again. You make things worse, not better. And let's try to find a way in which we can, you know, there can be disagreement and there can be nuance, but 
let's choose our model and then try and deliver it taking a 20 year view and uh, everybody wants that kind of consensus and as you say politics doesn't, politics doesn't always find it easy um, but I think we have the chance of that now in a way we haven't for 30 years and we should seize it. And are there next steps for the research project? Um, I think we, we have a um, seminar coming up at the Institute for Government in a few weeks time with um, lots of people from Whitehall and the political parties and academics coming to talk about it. But I think the um, the the big question is what the party say their manifesto is and whether they make raising growth and tackling these inequalities a priority for the next parliament. And if they do, do they then get on with it from the beginning rather than delaying and then regretting they've delayed? I'm sick of politicians doing interviews with us saying, if only we'd been bolder and more radical and more decisive earlier. And that's what John Major says, what Tony Blair says, what George Osborne says, what Gord Brown says, but you know, maybe the next generation should get on with it a bit quicker this time. So valuable life lesson, be bold from today. Get on um, with it. Well, Ed, thank you so much. So it's been Pleasure. absolutely fantastic. Everybody listening and watching, um, as Ed mentioned, you can read and, and look at all of those research papers. There's lots of interviews out there. Please do because it's absolutely fascinating. So thank you to a brilliant guest. Um, and to everyone watching, please join us for further episodes of the Social Mobility Talks podcast, where we'll be discussing a huge range of social mobility topics. Make sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or YouTube so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much.